Uh, you're all very welcome to tonight's discussion about the life and times of an extraordinary man, personal friend of mine. Actually, I, I wish that I wasn't in a position here to be chairing this meeting tonight. I'm sure many of you share that feeling. We're still in mourning for Martin McGuinness, who died last March. Martin was dairy born and bred. He was a husband, father, grandfather. He was a fighter and he was a peacemaker. I would also like to welcome members of Martin's family here tonight, particularly Fakra and Emmett, and uh, extend our thoughts to Bernie and uh, Fanula and Grania. So we want to begin tonight, and later on we're going to be hearing from uh, Mitchell McLaughlin, veteran Republican, former uh, MLA, a close friend of Martin since childhood, and Mary, Mary Lou MacDonald, no, last year. No, no, an older Republican <laughs> and a younger Republican. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. I like that. <laughs> As most and, of the people uh, I know in the room. <laughs> Vice President of uh, Sinn Féin and uh, TD for Dublin Central. Dublin Central. Can I just say one thing? So I noticed that um, one of the things that really grated when, when Martin died is the kind of the new revisionist line, which was actually there were two Martin McGuinnesses. So there was, you know, the IRA volunteer, troublemaker, hellraiser, bog side piece of the story. And then some unspecified moment of redemption, I don't know, road to Damascus stuff. And then the new shiny, clean, <laughs> diplomatic, fabulous Martin McGuinness. The truth is, of course, of as all of us who knew him in the veteran years or later on, is that that's absolute nonsense. There was one person. He was always a tough cookie. With, and he was tough as nails. But he was also a person who was very instinctive in his politics. I think somebody who could read a situation, not just with his head, but with his gut. And somebody who understood that, that rarely are things simply black or white or linear, that he, could, he, he understood all of that. So anyway, fast forward to 2011, wasn't that the presidential election? So Martin had been convinced to stand. And let me tell you, he really, really did not want to do it. <laughs> but he was browbeaten into doing it because we said, you're the best person to do it. So didn't I, take my advice on that occasion. As he was, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's right. So he, he took the advice of the rest of us and he stood. And I remember on just one particular moment in that campaign, there was a rally in the Mansion House. And Cullen Meany had come home. Do you remember to compare it? It was a great event. But Martin had been getting what I can only describe as dog's abuse in the southern media, and it was spurred by that thing that you mentioned, that sense that Sinn Féin was on the move, that we had breached the border, that all of a sudden the citadel is under attack yeah. from, you know, the barbarians, we were everywhere. Uh, and they didn't want him. They, they took a view of the southern establishment that really um, a man from the bog side a dairy man wasn't Irish enough, uh, wasn't appropriate, was not the person who was suited to go forward. And the, the, I, I think the media coverage at that time shocked a lot of our people from the north. They couldn't believe that that level of hostility was possible, but it was. Maybe McAleese went through it as well. I know, but not as president. She went through it in, in RT, so, but it was, it was quite stark. But this night, in any event, in the Mansion House, uh, and I've said this before, for me, was the most compelling, honest account that Martin gave of everything that you two have spoken about of the early years in the Bogside and the why of joining the IRA. And he spoke very, very honestly. I don't know if other people remember that night that I'm referring to. He talked about how Bernie and he had known people who had died and been injured. He talked about how afraid he was at the time. You know, as a young fella, he was only a kid. He talked about being afraid joining, but he said he would have been ashamed not to. And he explained in very human terms exactly how that felt at that time. And I knew Martin well, and I never knew him ever to resile from that position. That is what happened, and that was the truth. And Martin was true to that. Um, 
and it, it, it's a terrible pity that there weren't cameras rolling that night and that that wasn't recorded and broadcast because it was the clearest articulation of a person of Martin's generation, generally, but for him specifically, of what happened to him. And yes, he was as tough as nails, and that didn't change. And he had high standards, and he expected the best. And I think he had every right, actually, to expect the best. And when we didn't give of our best, he had every right. In fact, he had a responsibility to give us what I will only describe as the look. <laughs> you didn't have to say anything. Just the look uh, was sufficient for Martin. You got a smile from Mitchell, who's doing it now, I hope for other reasons, but you got the look from, from Martin McGuinness. When he was Minister for Education, I can tell you, and I remember we went into a general election, would it have been 2000 and, just keep me right on my dates, what date was he? It was, Minister? It was one 2002, the, 2001, 2001, 2002. That's when took the SDLP. Yeah, and we had a, a, a general election uh, in the South, and I remember being out knocking doors and going into places that we hadn't gone before because we just decided, feck it, we're going in to talk to the middle classes, whether they like it or not. <laughs> Lots of them did like it, as it turns out. And particularly when you got talking to anybody with an interest in education, teachers at any level, parents, Martin McGuinness was the talk of the place because of the stance that he took on the 11 plus. People were so impressed at his enlightened view, but also impressed that he actually had the bottle to take on what was a very significant vested interest. And I remember coming back to party me meetings and reporting this back to him. And of course he was delighted, not out of a sense of ego, but he was just so pleased that you could start to see that kind of real bread and butter, social justice politics kind of permeating the border and, and moving uh, along. I, I think you'd struggle in, in the South to find any significant political figure who would not tell you that they greatly admired Martin McGuinness. I think it's noticeable that they waited a long time to say it out loud. But, but, um, but at the time of the, the presidential election, yeah. and it's a, it's go, it presents an ongoing massive problem for the project of reunification, and it is the degree, the, 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 the way partition has affected the psyche of many people in the 26 counties. It could be explained for 50, 60 years by RTE, Section 31, right up mm -hmm. until the peace process. But I mean, you had people who actually said, why don't you go back to your own country? Mm -hmm. And this mentality, you know, the black north, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that attitude, which is, which is there, and which is still there. And you know, it's a, mass, it's a problem we have to overcome because you could be in a situation of having, I suppose, mathematically come around to 51% approval for reunification in the north, and you still have this problem in the south which Republicans, it's an ongoing difficulty, I'm sure you know this. Yes, of course. Um, but bear in mind that uh, for generations, people have been actively encouraged in that view to either fa fear or not recognise uh, the six counties as part, even geographically, of the entity that we call Ireland. And that's had... <coughs> varying uh, levels of success. Um, I think all of that can be overcome. I know, I know Martin believed that all of that could be overcome. That, that's why he took on a project like running for Aris on, on Uchtheron, because he understood, as, as we understand still, that the reunification agenda isn't a simply a northern concern, although undoubtedly uh, northern nationalists have suffer suffered the sharpest edge of partition. The South didn't get away scot-free either, just to say that. But um, so he understood that and he was prepared to go for it. And he was a very interesting character because he, he was pragmatic, but he was also very, very resolute. So once he decided that he was doing that, that was it. And when the brickbats came and I mean, just outrageous stuff. Uh, how do you sleep at night, asks the national broadcaster. How indeed, Miriam. Um, <laughs> Vincent Brown with, he must have raided the local library, you know. I hope his ticket was in order. Jesus, he had a pile of books this on. You're in this book and you're in that book. And Martin stood there just and... 
and he absorbed all of that. And I, I'm very sure that can't always have been easy uh, for him, but I'm sure it was very, certainly not easy for people who loved him and for his family, and, and it annoyed the hell out of everyone else. But he had this quality to, to just actually, make, for him, but for everyone to understand that you don't get distracted by that, because this is a tactic that they employ to throw us off course. So for me, he was absolutely resolute. And once the decision was made, you looked that way. But if you had made a plan with him that you were doing something, and if for some reason you strayed from the plan, he wanted to know why you strayed from the plan, and he wasn't very happy, as people will know. That's, that's the, way he, the way he went uh, about things. People had a lot of kind things to say about him, and, and why wouldn't they? I was struck by, uh, and I said this to him at the time, do you know when he was meeting the Queen and he did this gig in Windsor Castle and he had to wear a white suit? Do you remember? It wasn't black tie, it was white tie. Do you remember all of that? It didn't always, we need to be very honest with ourselves, that didn't always play well with us at all levels uh, of Irish nationalism. But here's the significant measure of, of Martin. He knew and was convinced that this was uncomfortable, unpalatable, but necessary and the right thing to do. And once he had that compass set in his head, there was nothing that would deter him or freak him out or, or, or cause him to kind of falter and second guess himself. And in this business, and particularly in, in the early phases that you've discussed there, it's obvious why you need that sense of purpose and steadiness. But equally, now and in more recent years, and right up until uh, calling time and saying that there will be no return to the status quo, that steadiness, that really steady sense of purpose was very necessary and he never, he never lost it. And for me, that was the most the most standout quality of how he carried himself. But I was completely bewildered by what turned out to be a genuine friendship with Ian Paisley. Yeah. Who, Ian Paisley signifies certain uh, a past to me, uh, which I find difficult to reconcile with this friendship. But Martin, I remember at uh, the funeral of Leo Wilson in Anderson Martin, I said, well, did you drive down from Derry? No, he says, I was over with Aileen Paisley, mm -hmm. over condoling with her. I think Paisley had died a few months earlier. And, I mean, I find that incredible. What's your view on that, Mitchell? Well, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't claim to fully understand it either, but obviously the chemistry, <laughs> the chemistry between them was very genuine. And, uh, I mean, Paisley Sr. Had, uh, had made a very considerable contribution to the, uh, the conflict that, that emerged. Uh, but I do think that he became convinced that uh, there would only be peace if there was uh, at least uh, an understanding. Now, I think that went much further than uh, he originally envisaged that it would. Uh, I mean, Martin's kind of approach to anyone, whether it is uh, you know, a young lad in the street that maybe uh, would have said hello to him or to, uh, you know, a senior uh, adversary like uh, Ian Paisley was, uh, was one of, of respect, if that at all was possible. And he started on that basis. He also articulated when he got the opportunity to, uh, to get talking to people to, uh, to indicate that, uh, you know, Ireland uh, as a country and as a nation uh, had experienced both, uh, you know, its own kind of Irish national identity and history, and also British history because of just the longevity of, uh, of, of Britain's interference in our country. So he talked in terms of shared history, and that's what brought him to meet the Queen, that's what brought him to uh, go into Messines, you know, not because he, he was a great admirer of the British Army, but he accepted the fact that many people from Ireland both from the Unionist tradition in Ireland and the, uh, the Nationalist tradition had gone off to perish on the fields of Flanders. You were there, right? I was, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was there. I mean, but Martin was actually the person that started kind of breaking down that topic. Yeah. Because, I mean, I took no interest in it until uh, fairly recently. Uh, and I accepted that was a blind spot in my particular uh, political analysis. And it was a serious blind spot. 
but Martin's idea was, you know, how could you <coughs> demand respect for your own tradition if you don't show respect for others' traditions? And uh, how can we expect uh, a mutually respectful future if we don't kind of recognise mm -hmm. and acknowledge our past? So, his, for instance, in uh, meeting the Queen and going to uh, Flanders and going into Stormont, you know, when you look around you and you go to Stormont, you know, it's British stroke unionist history, you see. It literally was a cold house for nationalists. But it is still, nonetheless, for all that it represented for more than 50 years, it's part of our past. It's part of our history. In my opinion, an unfortunate history and one that we were changing. You know, so I think he is envisaging the conflict over uh, national reconciliation and, and national uh, self-determination for the people of Ireland, all codified in the Good Friday Agreement now. He was seeing that far ahead. He was actually envisaging this agreed Ireland in which people could, if they wished, have, uh, have uh, dual citizenship. You know, so if you feel British, then you still are British, but the constitutional situation mm -hmm. has been transformed. So. I remember uh, we, we made a trip to the Somme, to Messines, to Ypres um, in May 2016. Martin was going as Deputy First Minister, myself and Declan this Garney. Is just last year. Yeah, went along with him. And I hadn't been, I hadn't made that trip before. And I suppose, like any Republican, I'd, I'd mixed feelings about, I couldn't have anticipated how the trip would be. But I think for me personally, that is the time where I fully get and understand what it is that Martin is at. Um, and to have been there, and it, it's quite something, it's, it's, it's quite something to see, let's call them the, the killing fields of yeah. the carnage of what is wrongly termed a great war. Absolutely, it, it is, is a devastating, devastating sight. Um, and at the time, Conor Heaney, who a, a dairy man found of course. visited, of course, for the first time, uh, the grave of his grandfather, and that was an astonishing moment as well. And we were, were all of us reflecting on the fact nobody, none of his people, none of his blood has been here in in all in all those in all those decades. And Martin had all this figured out, so. To the rest of us, he carried off his duties as a statesman effortlessly, absolutely graciously. And the war welcome that we got was incredible. Actually, by people, you know, in the Ulster Tower. Yeah. Um, and they were obviously people of, of a, a, the unionist tradition. They told us this, but they were, they could not have been more delighted to have us visit and to discuss the history and the misconceptions within their own community of what actually happened and why. It was a very interesting uh, event, but that's the, uh, almost like a, a, a moment, a snapshot of how Martin demonstrated that you could be staunch in your own identity, in your own politics as an Irish Republican, not to concede on that one iota, and still there is space yeah. for the other. That's that's the and he did that not by talking about it, Danny. He did that by actually doing, doing it. it. Yeah. And as Gibb said in in an article that he wrote, as Jim Gibby said, said, he had the capacity through that to eventually, when we got our heads around things, to make to make nationalist Ireland right across the island walk tall, because that's the stuff I think of real deeply rooted confidence particularly when you consider everything, go back into the 1960s and before, right. back to the 1920s, and yet our leader, our leader found that in him for us. But Extraordinary the, stuff. To get back to the parochial level, uh, I mean, Mitchell mentioned there the, the, the importance of remaining close to your base, mm -hmm. and we had, in the last two to three years, a large number of insults. You know, you had the email from Florida, mm -hmm. there will be no Mays Long Case Long project. Cash, correct. You had uh, the attempt by Simon Hamilton to pull the wool over Sinn Féin's eyes 
in regards to the mitigation mm -hmm. for unemployed RHI, people, yeah, yeah. right? And then you had the, the slow build-up of the RHI scandal, mm -hmm. and then before Christmas, the withdrawal of money for LIFA. And at that, that stage, it was called a halt through, mm -hmm. right? But there was a feeling that uh, we were being too generous. Mm -hmm. There was a feeling um, across a wide section of our community, north and south, that it was very much a case of one-way traffic. I think that I think that was a fair feeling. There was a feeling that, you know, unionism was determined in its effort and, and successful, some felt, in constantly pushing back the tide of change. And people were frustrated. We were frustrated. Martin was frustrated by that. And you've instanced there a number of the kind of high profile, uh, you know, blowback from, from the DUP, for the letter from America and, and all of that. But there were many, many others that didn't necessarily get you know, very high level media coverage. And it was a, a war, uh, you know, a, of attrition, you know, a game of cat and mouse. When it came down to it, and when, when this RHI scandal loomed large, Martin went to Arlene, quietly, Arlene Foster, and said to her, if I were you, this is what I would do. She was given the out. Because that, that's the way he would go about it. He wouldn't be one for straight into high dramatics. That's, she and they chose not, not to opt for that. And we debated these things at a leadership level, as you do, and we we're conscious, of course, always as to where our own base is and where the popular view is. And most importantly, how you move things forward, because you have to be real at the end of the day in terms of progress. And it became apparent that we could no longer, and that Martin would no longer, stand over uh, a situation where institutions had clearly been robbed of their basic public credibility. He couldn't do that. And I, I think that, uh, I think unionism didn't see that coming. I think they thought wrongly, and it would always be a mistake to imagine that we don't have other options or other plans. We will always have plans B, preferably all the way to Z, lined out, because that's necessary in political planning. And Martin was quite resolute in matters. And I, I, I wonder when I hear supposedly insightful commentators say very learnedly, of course, all of this would be sorted out if Martin were here. Of course, ignoring the very fact that Martin is the one who said this far and no further. Not to be belligerent, that wasn't... But on that, on that, but, on that but, to, but to actually put down a marker and say, because there does come a point where you have to say, now hang on a minute, we're not going on a merry-go-round forever for the next 10 years. And Martin knew and felt very deeply that it was a necessary thing for the common good on, to, on the, on the night of his resignation, I mean, there's two things struck me. First of all, people were sh totally shocked mm -hmm. at the state he was in. I don't think people realised uh, how far gone his condition was. Secondly, ironically, along with that shock, there was a tremendous sense of pride that at last we had pulled the rug from underneath this farce what was happening here and I just think people were so relieved and, uh, and emboldened and uh, I, th I just think it was a powerful powerful moment but again it, on the other hand it was this look uh, you know Martin's condition I mean, when, when were you aware of how serious things were I, I thought from what I had heard that under this particular condition that Martin was suffering from that he could live for six or seven years and I know he was looking forward to retiring in May and being with his family and his grandkids and that when did you, you, you <coughs> Well, I mean, it, it, it was not a very easy thing to, uh, to admit to, but to me uh, it became evident that uh, Martin's condition was actually very, very serious and, and uh, as it transpired, even more serious than I thought. Uh, I, had, uh, I had formed a view that uh, it, would be, it wouldn't be possible for Martin to, uh, to, to kind of just step back into the, uh, the role, I think, is... Uh, 
and people you know may not fully understand but for me uh, one of the most awesome uh, things about Martin was his stamina mm. I could not believe the amount of physical effort that he put into his role and I wouldn't have been capable of it and I mean I, I did a fair amount of galloping about myself but you could not in any sense at all compare to the uh, the commitment that he not only to his uh, duties as he prescribed them for himself but also his dedication to his family then because like in those very constrained and demanding circumstances he uh, you know if it was at all physically possible he went home at night uh, so I mean that kind of uh, leadership in my view and commitment took its toll in the end of uh, he just kind of came to the view that the man was indestructible and, and I have to say that um, for me uh, when I first became aware of just how sick he was uh, it, it was like a hammer blow now I think in, in terms of the uh, the decisions that he took and that very clear and we saw it in the film you know it would be impossible to kind of script that uh, with more clarity than that which Martin McGuinness, even as a very sick man, uh, he spelt it out. And unionists would do well to kind of study what he said. I'm quite certain that the British government are studying it. Because he made it clear, you know, if you think that it's just <laughs> that you're going to step back into those roles and that behaviour. Now, I think that, uh, you know, that may well turn out to be, of all the, the absolutely awesome contributions that he made, that may turn out to be the most significant in strategic terms, because the uh, you know that made it clear that uh, you know the future for all of us is in honouring the deals that we make with each other, because we're prepared to respect the differences and the different perspectives and the different ambitions that we have. He could do that. Uh, he was telling people that he could do that. He had demonstrated that he could do that. Uh, you know, he did make reference, uh, I think, in an interview prior to that, in the months in the run-up to his illness emerging, uh, to, the, to the lack of reciprocation. But he also, in conversation, and I'm sure he shared that with you, he did understand it. He knew that at the end of the day, the unionists were uh, absolutely dependent on the British link because they could not make the leap to see in their strength, uh, their, their, uh, their future in, uh, in, in, in a, a relationship of equals with the rest of the people in this island. And that's what Martin, who I think was the best friend that unionism could have, he was showing them the way, he was showing them how we could resolve this and our differences peacefully and manage our own affairs. And, and you know, that final statement by Martin McGuinness is as clear a statement of intent, in my view, as Theobald <laughs> Will Tone's <laughs> statement at the time of his arrest. Well, Mary, what's your last memories of Martin? I last saw Martin when I visited him, um, I don't know, m maybe a week, 10 days or so before he died. Um, at least that's my recollection. And I was struck at, at that, it, that he was weak. Um, I didn't think he'd die, um, to be honest with you. And you, you look back now and you say, God, you know, was that entirely misguided? How, how could you have thought that we had a good conversation? We were actually we were out on the election trail and he was getting all the scandal and what was happening and he wanted to know. and. I was saying this earlier, in the way that Irish people do, you know, you, you go somewhere and you ask the question almost automatically, say, is there anything that you want me to do? Thinking, you know, just as you say, and he, he says, yes. So I said, grand, we're in business. And he said, uh, Mary Lou, I want you to go out and win. And actually, those were the last utterances of my friend and leader. Martin McGuinness to me. So I didn't think he'd, he'd die. I mean, we were all very shocked. We're still shocked. And even now when we meet, a part of you expects the door to open and for him to walk in. Um, but that's not going to happen. But what we do have is just a, a, a tremendous legacy. And Michelle now has stepped into a particular role here in the North. And I know that Martin was very very proud of that um, 
And I know I, I'm picturing his reaction somewhere, listening to the kind of the implied slur against her or us or whatever, that actually that Martin somehow would have taken a different view. We were very, very tight, as you know, Danny, very, very tight. And we'll remember him, and more importantly, we, we will never, ever forget, we will never, ever betray his legacy. And he's right, this has to be finished. That's, this now has to be finished by us, the veterans, the young ones, the, the collaborators, the sandwich makers, which is now, which is now code for Calabatou. Yeah. So, uh, the, uh, I mean, it was a remarkable funeral. Yeah. Uh, we brought our goddaughter to it, and just incredible the numbers there. And Christy Moore wrote about the funeral. It was a great privilege to sing today at Martin's graveside. I was inside the church for two hours with his family, neighbours, and friends with his comrades, his pals, his buddies, volunteers, presidents past and present, Taoiseachs past and present, TDs, MEPs, MLAs, senators, ministers, clergy, holy men and roly poly men. <laughs> and I sat there reflecting upon all the times I met Martin, all the different situations, gigs, meetings, fundraisers, rallies, mostly in earlier days. I remember sitting backstage with him at a Bloody Sunday commemoration concert in the old Rialta, him and his then young sons in Chamberlain Street after a Smash Hits Block concert, the night I first heard back home in Derry, in the Burlington in Dublin at an awards function. No matter where it was, Martin never changed. The gentle word, the soft smile, the bit of banter. I sat there today and invoked all I could call upon to help me sing that song for his family, that I could do it, that I could do it without faltering. And I had the very thought that you expressed, that I was singing the song on behalf of all of us. I will never forget this day. There is something in the air. Christine Muir. Thank you. Thank you.